So uh, Matt Wilder here with Hands and Feet Piano Ministry. Um, this ministry proclaims Holy Scripture, and it's accompanied with piano music and hymn arrangements, and I offer this to God as an aroma of Christ to help spread the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. And so that's my prayer in my heart today, is just that God's Word would um, be a blessing for all of us as we worship in spirit and truth. This evening, specifically, we're going to be journeying through the book of Romans. How many of you all like the book of Romans? <laughs> one of my favorite oh man and so I've got a program here hopefully is a useful resource for you that'll kind of show you specifically the passages we'll be covering so feel free if you want to get out a bible or your bible apps and follow along for those passages you're welcome to do that also on that program towards the bottom is my website and on there there's a lot of resources there's some Bible audio recordings uh, scored or set to music. There's, uh, I've got five piano ministry programs, uh, live presentations. You can view all that, all the resources and music that this ministry currently offers, you can find on that website. And there's a contact on there as well. So if God blesses you through uh, this music ministry this evening and you like to share it with friends and family you know uh, that you think might be interested in w what I offer here, um, feel free to pass along that information. I'd be grateful for that. Um, by the way, it's a little chilly here. I came from uh, Orlando yesterday, and it's still a swamp down there. It's 90 degrees, 95% humidity every day. And so coming up here, it was actually really refreshing. But I was like looking around, where are the penguins? It feels really cold. So, <laughs> so it might take like 20 minutes for my fingers to get warmed up. But no, just. All right, with that said, let's go. We're going to start in actually Romans chapter 1. I think it's verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For the women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Chapter 2. Therefore, you are without excuse O oh man, 
every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, every one of you who judges those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. yourself. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. As it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. All right, so far here in the book of Romans, chapters one and two, the Apostle Paul has clearly and firmly established that all are under sin. In chapter one, he references some of the evil pagan works of these Gentiles and how they are under God's judgment because they rejected God's natural revelation and chose to worship and serve themselves and created things rather than God himself. And so in response to this, God gave them up to a debased mind to do all sorts of wickedness. Now in chapter 2, the Apostle Paul pivots and he addresses the self-righteous Jews and tells them that they're not any better off. For although they had God's written law, they didn't keep it. And they too deserve God's judgment. So what was this written law given to Israel? The summation of God's moral law can be found in what's called the Ten Commandments, which was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. And we can read from Deuteronomy chapter 5, starting in verse 6, where God says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days so you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath. To the Lord your God, on it you shall not do any work. And it goes on to say, Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder and you shall not commit adultery and you shall not steal 
and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And it goes on to say, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, Moses writes to Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And these words that I've commanded you today shall be on your heart. back to the book of Romans chapter 3 moving on the apostle Paul writes in verse 9 what then are we Jews any better off no not at all for we have already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under sin as it is written none is righteous no not one no one understands no one seeks for God all have turned aside together they have become worthless no one does good, not even one. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also, since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith through faith? Do we then overthrow the law because of this faith? By no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. Chapter 4. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift but as his due. And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Let's celebrate the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ who has saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. blessed assurance we have in Jesus Christ. Chapter 5. Therefore, 
since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith in the disgrace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For at the right time, while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, we have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift through the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord.
chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we'll also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, and the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Let's move on to verse 22. Now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So the simple Roman road, if you're going to boil it down to four verses, um, I was talking with Pastor Nace last night, and he's like, this is what he uses every Sunday uh, to close out his sermons or whatever. Um, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Now we're going to have to find out what are the other two. Still got some more to go. Just wanted to leave you on that cliffhanger. All right. Well, um, before we move on to chapter 7, got a uh, couple of songs for you here. Jesus' call for us Christians is for us to take up our crosses and come after him. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're called to live lives of sacrificial and obedient servitude to Jesus, enduring Christian suffering with a joy and peace that only he can offer, and learning to love God above everything else. Jesus said in John, or excuse me, in Matthew 16, 24 to 26, if anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? And Jesus said in Luke 14, verse 33, Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. God, this is our prayer before you today. Make us complete for every good work to do your will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in your sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I surrender all.
Now, in our Christian walk, we're going to stumble at times for sure. And Romans chapter 7 highlights this struggle. If we go down to verse 21, Paul writes, I find it to be a law then when I want to do what's right. Evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind bringing me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Guys, when we sin, let's remember that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, and always lives to make intercession for those who would draw near to God through him. We have Jesus, a great and sympathetic high priest who has been tempted in every way as we have been, yet without sin. So let's draw near to him. Let's draw near to his throne of grace that we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. He is always there. We can call upon him. Psalm 130, verses 1 through 2. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. So again, Paul had written, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, moving on to chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead 
will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. Yes, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hopes that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our body, For in this hope we were saved. No hope that is seen is not hope. For who who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he 
also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we are being killed all the day long these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Have you guys experienced that, encountered that in your life? I know I have. God is love.
Jesus, how great thou art.
All right, so that third verse to the Roman road that I forgot to mention. Um, Romans 5, 8's a great one. Hard to leave that one out, right? But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. All right, we're going to move on to chapter 10 here. Starting in verse 1, the Apostle Paul, he writes, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say that the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart? That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. John 1, 16. Amazing grace. All right, in summary so far, we see that Jesus Christ, God's one and only Son, God the Son, 
manifested in the flesh, came down from heaven to save the world from sin and condemnation and to offer us eternal life because of his great love for us. Mankind's dilemma is that we have all sinned and fall short of God's glory. The wages of our sin is death, and all sinners deserve to have their portion in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. But mankind's hope is Jesus. He offers us an escape from the wrath to come and the heavenly eternal inheritance as his adopted children. This is made possible because as a perfect sacrifice, Jesus paid in full our sin debt owed to God on the cross of Calvary nearly 2,000 years ago when he died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, was buried and was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And this is the gospel. This is the good news. Jesus Christ and him crucified for our sins, buried and raised on the third day for our justification. Or as we read already from Romans 3.23 and beyond, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to Jesus. He has the power to forgive us of our sins and grant us eternal life. Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be open. Now God's word assures us that if we ask anything according to his will, then he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, then we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. You see, God desires for all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He does not wish for any to perish, but would rather that all reach repentance. If you have never called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and received him as your personal Lord and Savior, today can be the day of your salvation. Today, you can be born again in spirit through faith in this good news of Jesus Christ. I urge you, if you haven't already, be reconciled to God in him. And the way you do this, it's very simple. Admit that you're a sinner. Repent. Turn from your sin to God in faith. Believe that Jesus Christ is God's one and only Son and confess Him as your Savior and your Lord. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen? Well, just in case this may apply to someone here and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, I want to provide this opportunity now. We could do that through prayer. Though I want to emphasize it's not the ritual of prayer that saves, but it's the heart of faith. It's the heart of belief. Because with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. So let us believe on the Lord and let us call upon his name. Father God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve death and hell because of my sin. I have sinned against you, God, who are holy, righteous, and just. Lord, your word also teaches that you are loving, kind, you're merciful, gracious, and patient. Mercy can triumph over judgment because you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to live a perfect life and then to die on a cross for my sins. Yes, for the sins of the whole world. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that you were buried and were raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And so I call upon your name now. Jesus, and I ask you to save me, forgive me, grant me this free gift of eternal life that is through faith in your name. I repent, I turn from my sin to you in faith, trading my sin for the gift of your perfect righteousness, God, and asking now that you would send your Holy Spirit to dwell in me, seal me for the day of redemption, reign over my life, God, that together we might live the life that you have called me to live now and glorify in your name. Thank you, God, for saving me. Today is the day of my salvation. Today I am born again in spirit through faith in this good news of Jesus Christ. Not because of my works, but because of your perfect and finished work, Jesus. And now in response to this gift of grace, 
I want to take up my cross daily and follow you as one of your disciples. Help me to do so in the strength and power that you supply through your spirit who now dwells inside of me. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Ephesians 1.13 promises, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Jesus, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And we also have this assurance from 1 John 5.13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? Have you received Jesus? Do you believe in him? If by chance this happens to be the day of your salvation, um, we praise God for that, and I'd encourage you after the service to go find Pastor Glenn and, and share with him what God's worked in your life today, and he can lead you into um, what it means to become a follower of Jesus Christ. All right, um, we're getting ready to close out here. And so that fourth verse uh, that I want to emphasize that we just shared earlier was Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In concluding this journey through the book of Romans, um, I just have a couple more passages I want to share. Uh, starting in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, the Apostle Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, so that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And finally, from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14, Paul writes, Oh, no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are fulfilled in this one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the fulfilling of the law, therefore. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, excuse me, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Guys, let us abide in Jesus and so bear fruit to the praise of his name. Let's abide in his love, joy, and peace and in all of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let us abide in his word and to be sanctified in the truth. And let us abide in his great commandment to go out into all the world and proclaim the gospel to all of creation. Let our eyes look directly forward and our gaze be straight before us. Let's look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us look forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And let us long for the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen? In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Thank you all for being here.